Welcome back to the Solid Verbal Boys and Girls. My name is Ty Hildenbrandt, that fine gentleman over there, as always, in the heart of the Midwest, Dan, the man, Rubenstein, sir. Welcome back to the podcast. How goes it, my friend? It's great. As always, Ty, it's great. Very excited for this episode because it is the absolute height of the math I'm able to do on the fly. I I maxed out, I think, in, at like uh, trigonometry? What's trigonometry is after algebra two in high school? I believe I think. so. Yeah, I had. I never took calculus. I took statistics. A AP stat. Gotta be tied, not to brag. Yeah, I had trigonometry. Then I had calculus, and then I, for whatever reason, when I went to Penn State, I was put mm -hmm. in another calculus class that I needed to take as one of my prereqs for something. Yeah, it was one of those pilot courses that allowed you to use a graphing calculator. Oh, which yeah, saved that's right. you're just a felon yeah that saved my hide in a way like you would not believe i do believe it Holy. i don't know any of that stuff i don't remember a damn thing from it yeah i i remember hearing my smarter friends whether they were business majors or something that had to keep taking math and i was like wait what comes after calculus and they said linear algebra and i was like that sounds way easier than calculus it's a line it's algebra I have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, so to all of those who are mathematically inclined, I salute you because, again, this episode is the absolute height of what I'm now able to do in my fifth dec decade of life on the fly. Hey, sorry for the quick interruption, but it'd be incredible if you considered subscribing to the Solid Verbal YouTube channel right down below. So here's what we're doing today, Dan. Yeah. You may have seen out on ESPN.com, as they are wont to do here in the offseason. They put together a top 10 coaches ranking. Yeah. Very subjective. It, of course, brought in the power and the knowledge and the insight of many of ESPN's great college football reporters. Their ranking went as follows. Kirby Smart, Kalen DeBoer, Kyle Whittingham at three, Dabo Swinney, Mike Norvell, Dan Lanning, four through six, Steve Sarkeesian, Lane Kiffin, Lance Leipold, and Ryan Day to round out the top 10 with no real rhyme or reason right it was sort of aggregating uh a, a number of different opinions right i think it was uh, different writers or was it one writer yep. who's to say um but it was just it was going off of like specific perceptions and you're like well this is important to me or this person was able to do this at a smaller place so i'm impressed by this or this person has done this lately or this person has shown this over so many years, so he has to be here. Um, but it wasn't fully clear. Like, everything wasn't, like, uh, attached to the same rubric. That's correct. It, seems. That, it wasn't that's weighted correct. all the same way. Yeah. That's correct. So people online have been talking about this ranking system because, again, mm -hmm. it's early April, mid-April. What else are we going to talk about other than the transfer portal and the Super League and some of the other news topics going on in college football, spring football starting up? Et cetera, et cetera. We decided this needed an actual formula. Yeah. This needed a rubric of sorts. We needed to put up some walls around this ranking system. Yes. You said to me yesterday, can we come up with a coach rating system that uses the initials D A B O? Correct. I took it into the lab here in Eastern Pennsylvania, Solid Verbal East headquarters. What we're going to present before you today is something we're calling the X Dabo coach. And I guess it's scale. unweighted, right? Because the four elements of the formula, none is weighted more than the other, right? It's equal weight given to each one. It, it's equal weight here in the X Dabo scale. The unweighted X Dabo, yeah. Here is the way that this thing works. In each of these four categories, we're going to rank a coach on a scale of one to 10, one being the worst, 10 being the best. Yeah. The D stands for dependability. Yep. What does that mean? It means dependability. How consistent is a coach? How reliable are his results? How comfortable are we with projecting results forward based on the track record? This is what he's done, and for that, we expect him to do this. Yeah. The A stands for adaptability, and there's a lot that I think we can bundle in here, but how good is a coach at adjusting on the fly with 
decisions and play calling in the moment. And then bigger picture, if we zoom out, how good is that guy at adjusting the philosophy of his program? So right. the example that I've used a million times over, and maybe it's not as applicable now, given what we saw last season. But after Dave Aranda's year one with Baylor, there were a lot of gripes with how he managed things. Super conservative. Yeah. And he came out the next year and went for it a lot more and fourth down and made some changes and Baylor was a lot better. That was yep. a moment of adaptability. We won't spend too much time talking about what Dave Aranda's done since then. Right. Or somebody hired a coordinator year one, clearly didn't work. And instead of drawing it out, hoping for improvement, they knew that it wasn't a match and they just moved on immediately. That's yeah. right. That's right. The B is build quality. Yep. How good is a guy at acquiring talent? How good is he at developing the talent? So this applies on the recruiting front. This also applies on the hiring front. Yeah. Nick Portal Saban as well. Yeah. Nick Saban for years had this well known, famous coaching tree. Guys who went there for a one or two year internship, went on to bigger and better things, maybe running their own shop like Sark or Lane Kiffin or Nick Saban's known for that. So how yeah. good are these guys at developing their players and their coaches that are underneath them? Correct. That's your B. D A B. Finally is O, opportunity. Mm. Opportunity. What's a coach's ceiling, man? What's a coach's ceiling? This is, this is a very relative measure as part yes. of this extremely goofy and imaginary scale. Right. How do you define up. a six? How do you define an eight? How do you define a three? How do you define a 10? Yeah. You can make a pretty good case that Kalen DeBoer, even though Kalen DeBoer went to a national championship with Washington, you can make right. a pretty good case that his ceiling at Washington was a lot lower, bigger picture, than it will be at Alabama. He will have more opportunity at Alabama, I think, to be great, to win championships, to get back to that yes game. Yes and no. Yeah. Okay, you can make that case. We can argue that out. So what we're doing essentially is we are taking four different categories as elements of our methodology. Within those categories, we are hoping to consistently define what each number is. And even though we are picking numbers subjectively, we're showing our work and applying that same method to each guy. So you can disagree with, you know, I'm giving Ryan Day a seven here. I'm giving Luke Fickle a nine here. But at least we're applying the same That's right. you know, method to each of them. And so, you know, there are some of these where I like I found out like my top 10 based on independently selecting scores for each of these these elements. And I was like, I don't know that that's my top 10, but how do I argue no. with, you know, this is my choice and this is what I have to roll with because at least it's applied evenly throughout the process. And there, so there is one other element to this. Oh, bonus. I said X Dabo. Oh, that's true. We put the X there to make it look official, like there was some actual science behind this. There Obviously. is no science. There is just rudimentary math. I assure you of that. Mm -hmm. We're capable of nothing more. Thank you, computer. <laughs> the X stands for PR and media chops. Yeah. Doesn't apply to everybody. So I think for somebody like Brian Kelly, Brian Kelly, we might be willing to give him a few bonus points. So this is something that we can use if we want to, zero to five, if we want to add a few bonus points for somebody who is particularly good at dealing with the media. Now, that, of course, Wait, can we can we say the X is for extrovert, extrovert, extroversion? Perfect. Extroversion, if that's a word. Sure. Synergy right here. Love it. I love it. The reason that we would incorporate this as part of the skill, it doesn't have anything to do with what's going on on the field. Right. But Fact check. Extroversion is a word. Continue. Extroversion is <laughs> definitely a word. <laughs> I didn't know. The reason that we should put this in here is because yeah. if the media turns against a guy or if the fan base turns against a guy because of the way he handles the media or the media portrays him, that often can spell doom. Certainly. Right? We have seen that happen before. Got to play the game. Got to play the game. So Brian Kelly is going to get a few extra bonus points with this. Zero to five. Yeah. Don't have to use it, but you can use it if you want to give a guy a few more bonus points to boost his rating a little bit based on what he right. do. Matt Rule with the emojis. That's got to be worth something, right? 
Well, look, if it's out of five, I'm giving Mac Brown like a nine right now for memorizing every reporter's first name. <laughs> Mac so like Brown the old Doc five. Rivers, Mac Brown. Great question, Adrian. Yeah, he could get a five. So yeah. that is the X Dabo scale. We came up with it yesterday. We're very yes. proud of it. We're very excited about this. And I think it finally puts some walls up with respect to how we're going to actually rank coaches. Yeah. So your your worst coach is probably a four, right? Yeah. If we're doing four categories, one through ten. And of course, if a, if a coach has a, a perfect grade, essentially, this scoring is out of 40. Just right. a clean, 40. a clean, 40. a clean, 40. okay. Beautiful. Yeah. And could go up to 45 if we're feeling generous. Well, no, I'm saying I, I'm using that as a bonus, but yes, we can after the fact. I I I scored it out of forty, and I'm using it the the X extra version as a separate element. But yeah, we can we can do the math on the fly because once again, between us, we have a a twelfth grade education <laughs> mathematically. <laughs> yeah, this is the moment in the show where I just casually remind everyone that if you like this concept, if you like this show, if you want to support us. Yeah. The most important thing you can do is hit follow or subscribe wherever it is that you're listening or watching this show right now. Yeah. Um, follow along on social media, hit the like button on all the stuff we're doing there. We've been pushing extra hard in the off season because we've got the time and the energy and we're excited about the season ahead. But these are some basic things, some simple things. We have people email all the time. What can I do to support the show? Uh, that's what you can do to support the show. If you're really into it for ballers.com, we'll post this episode early without the ads. There's a Discord that I know is going to be popping off talking about this as well as we get into all things X Dabo, Dan Rubenstein. Shall we dive yes. in? Let's dive in. The number one ranked coach in ESPN's unofficial ranking system was Kirby Smart. Yeah. Kirby Smart, I, I think for all intents and purposes here, does he represent the 40? Would he no. be the perfect 40 in no. our Dabo scale, X Dabo scale? No. Absolutely not. Why not? I don't know. I got. I want to make people earn it over. Like forty just seems like there's only one forty in my mind, Ty, and that's you. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Um, no, I don't. I don't have. He's my number one coach. I kind of want to go in sort of ascending order instead of descending because I have twenty nine grades here, and I know you're going. You're going at this a little bit more as like a uh, a scoring goalie here. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. the Martin Brodeur that's of right. this show. Is that a good one? Is that sure. a good reference that people will understand? Um, I have Dabo at 38. Excuse Dabo? me, Dabo. I have Kirby Smart at 38. Okay. Where is he getting doc points? Okay. So I have a 10 in terms of dependability. Okay. I have him as a 10 in terms of adaptability. I have him an eight in terms of build quality hmm. and a 10 in terms of opportunity ceiling. I'm giving him the eight in terms of build quality. Obviously, Georgia and Kirby Smart, they've been a sensational recruiting machine. But I'm docking him the eight because of the quarterback shuffling and the quarterback question throughout the years that I'm taking his experience in totality. And so we're talking about using the Justin Fields example, mismanaged. Yeah. We're talking about, you know, Jake Fromm getting worse that like, and I don't know if you want to put that in terms of development, whatever, but Jake Fromm, and it's a defensible move to stick with Jake Fromm the way he did. But the JT Daniels element, the the Jamie Newman not playing element, you know, it, it's hard to put that fully on Kirby Smart. Um, and then, like, essentially peaking at quarterback kind of by accident with Stetson Bennett. Well, and so I, I think there is an important distinction here that we should draw if we're going to go based on this scale. Sure. There is a distinction to be made between acquiring the talent and developing the talent. Agree. And they're, they're almost two separate things. He's been very good at developing talent. Look at what he did with Stetson Bennett. Agree. Totally agree. Right. Stetson, ben Stetson Bennett turned into like one of the all-time greats in Georgia history, maybe SEC yeah. history. A very, very good college quarterback by the time he left. But yeah. I think if Kirby Smart were starting over again, Stetson Bennett, he wouldn't have been the number one guy that he recruited to run his offense, right? As of you course. said, that quarterback system was a bit mismanaged. So I'm not, I'm not against docking some points there for right. build quality. We know that assistant coaches have developed handsomely under Kirby Smart. Dan Lanning, large, yeah. Dan Lanning, who we're going to talk about here, I'm sure in a little bit, 
sure. is is a great example of that. Fran Brown just left to go and coach Syracuse. He's obviously Munkin is doing great things in the NFL. Yep. Munkin's doing well in the NFL. Like there, there are definitely some guys that will go through and, and mention in passing that get an incomplete because we don't have a full picture of what they can do yet. But in terms of that side of things, Kirby's been yeah. really, really good. If we're pointing to just one thing though, with it's respect- the most important thing to me at quarterback. And like the Jacob Eason thing didn't work out. Like that's that's what I'm pointing to. Quarterback uh, recruitment, selection, and management. Can we give him a few extra bonus points, though, with the PR and media chops, the extra version category? Can we throw in a few extra? Out of five, what would I give Kirby? Yeah, we'd give him like a, maybe a, a three? Three bonus I'd give points. him a two or three. The only the, the docking thing is the way that he is weaponizing the state of Georgia with like the FOIA stuff that's mm. not as open as you'd like. But yeah, two or three, somewhere in there. We'll that's give fine. him a two. We'll get we'll get him up to an even 40. Yeah. If that works for you. Do you want me to quickly go through all of the coaches I have outside of my top 10? Or is that jumping around too much? Why don't we go next man up after Kirby? Okay. On my list? On your list. Or on the ESPN list? On your list. They've got Kalen DeBoer number two, which I saw, and that, I understand why they put him that high. Yeah. Surprised me a little bit. Surprised me a little bit that he was number two on this list already. Um, Who do you have two on yours? I have Kyle Whittingham on mine, which I might not do if you were just having a conversation with me, just over some Fantas or something, Ty. I don't know what the kids drink now, but... In terms of like when I went item by item, I I have him at 34 out of 40. Wow, that's really high. I have Kyle Winningham there. And I don't know if that's just because he's been like the sort of one of the deans of the sport because he's been at Utah forever and succeeding at Utah forever in different circumstances with different assistants and different conferences. This will now be what, his third conference? Sure. Uh, while at Utah, at least. Um, and so here I scored him 9988. So a nine dependability, he has been consistent. He's been You know that the consistent. results are something you can depend on, led by defense, led by line play, adaptability on the fly with decisions, play calling. Utah's not a team that generally beats itself in these games. They're the actual, they're the one who knock. They're the ones who beat the teams that are not able to navigate games consistently well. Build quality, uh, I knock them a little bit because of, you know, some offensive struggles, especially passing game struggles throughout the year that like he hasn't been able to adapt. Uh, well, I guess adaptability is not, but he hasn't in terms of like uh, finding offensive players, game changers at receivers, specifically quarterbacks to go downfield. That has not always been the case. And I have a ceiling as eight and the eight ceiling I came to define as this is somebody who can with regularity compete for a conference title to end up in a conference title game or beat teams consistently who are of that quality. Nine I have as like, you know, in a playoff conversation pretty often. Ten I have as like a, a definitive national championship threat often. Right. Kirby So smart. Right. Right. So I have Kyle Whittingham in that eight category because Utah's been to those games. They've won those games. They've beaten teams who've won those games. Like they've been, played in major bowl games as recently as what, a couple of years ago with the Rose Bowl gave um, what Penn State all they could handle they had you know Ohio State recently um, so that's where I have him scoring as a 34 dependability is I think his greatest ability he's been very very solid yeah as a coach you you sort of are more comfortable with Kyle Whittingham projecting his track record forward yeah than maybe anybody else on this list yeah you just know what you're going to get from year to year Adaptability and build quality, though, I'd, I'd push back a little bit, especially okay. in the build quality, you know, like the dependability is good in that, you know, most years you're going to get nine or 10 wins out of them. You just you sure. are. But from an adaptability standpoint, from a build quality standpoint, do we feel like the talent, do we feel like the willingness to adjust has gotten better? With Whittingham, because I see the same team kind of year in and year out, dependable, but not always adaptable to the way that college football around has changed. I don't know. I still feel like more teams are scared of Utah and their evolution over the course of the years. And look, it's it's 
consistency. Um, I mean, that's under dependability. Um, the way that they've used the portal on both sides of the ball has been impressive, right? They, they have the maybe their best playmaking quarterback ever via the portal. Um, they've filled in some gaps via the portal. They're not crazy aggressive. I know they've done pretty well at corner there. And even build quality via high school recruiting has steadily improved, probably maxing out with the, the Clark Phillips recruitment and development, you know, into a an all-American caliber corner. So I don't know, man. The evaluation, you know, even though recruiting stars wise, they're like top 25-ish, like, I don't know. They've got an unbelievable eye for talent on both sides of the ball outside of wide receiver. Do we want to throw in a bonus point or two? Oh, or, I think he's super likable. I'd put him in like two or three. I think three, I probably think a three. He's a good. Yeah. He's a good. All right. So he's a 34. I, I don't fundamentally disagree with any of that. I think that's fair. But yeah, you know, we need to push back on. He's it. also let some local talent go. When you look at like uh, what Devin Brown, Panay Sewell, uh, Jackson Powers Johnson's probably be a first round pick here. Um, there's been some some top level Utah talent that hasn't stayed home. But I don't know. I'm grading him pretty highly still. So what's interesting about this? If he's number two on your list, yeah, who's number two again on ESPN's? They've got Kalen DeBoer, but they've got Kyle Whittingham three. Right. Okay. Kirby Smart at 40, Kyle Whittingham at 34, number two on 38. our X, 38 in our X data, yeah, yeah. excuse me. Um, I think that feels about right to me. I'm okay. still, I, I still feel like Whittingham's number is a little higher. So you would dock him where? You would dock him with the build quality, like a six, seven? I think I'd dock him with build quality a little bit. Yeah, I might go okay. down a little bit more on that. So then, you gave him a nine, a nine, an eight, and an eight? Yes. Okay. So that's 34. That's 34. So my three, four, and five are tied at 33. Okay. okay? So you just said 38 for Whittingham. You meant 34. 34 for Whittingham, 34. 34 for Whittingham, 38 for Smart. 34 and 30. Out of a possible. 40! Yeah. What I like about this is that there is a clear tier system already There's a drop developing. Off. Yes. And that feels right to me. Continue. All right. So I have three guys tied at 33. Are you ready for it? Please. This one, so this is not necessarily my number three, tied for third. This might be the most controversial today, Ryan Day. Okay, mm. here, here's here, the knock on Ryan Day, obviously, is like, oh, he started on third base. Like, Urban Meyer built up that program. Ryan Day has largely kept it going successfully. He inherited a bunch of talent. You still have to win the games to me. So Ryan Day has been to a national championship game and lost and has been to a semifinal against the clear best team in America and barely lost. He's lost to precisely one team in conference, which is the absolute worst team for Ryan Day and Ohio State to lose to. But his record is still crazy good. He does actually win the games. More often than not, they're blowing teams out with regularity. Um, and I think it's very easy to look at Ryan Day and saying like, oh, he's diet urban or whatever, and he's building off of something else. And obviously he can't win the big one against Michigan. So we dock him there. All fair. But in this specific rubric tie, I grade Ryan Day out as a nine, six, nine, nine. Okay. I, so I would be that inclined is to, to say, go nine, six, 10, nine. Give him another point for build quality. The, the talent on hand is sure ridiculous and furthermore the coaching talent that he's got around him i think is is pretty good they have kept their foot on the gas this offseason in particular with trying to improve their talent again i hearken back to what i said on the last episode or two episodes ago about jeremiah smith who looks yeah. like a man among boys probably is going to contribute hopefully will contribute as part of that receiving core Sure. This year could already be the best receiver on the damn roster. The build quality at Ohio State is, I mean, I, it's like second to none at this point. They've got so much talent, Dan. I hear you. Uh, they get a nine because they just had a quarterback who, for a number of reasons, didn't fully work out. And offensive line recruiting and development is not in a great place at the moment. Am I a victim of the moment? Perhaps. But, 10 just means across the board, you're nails deep, right? And they're not at the moment. I like, I've liked most of the hires. Um, 
He has had to make some changes because it hasn't worked out at a couple of different positions. Uh, had to make a defensive coordinator change a couple years ago. Um, and that was kind of the reason that that team was a little bit too flawed in that national... Look, Devontae Smith was going to get in on anybody. But, like, I don't know. The the linebackers that year being torched by receivers against the better team. Like, I just don't think it's perfect. 10 out of 10 is an A+. All right. I don't think we give him any bonus points for media. Uh, I probably, yeah, maybe one or two, maybe a one somewhere in there. I have Ryan Day tied. Do you have issue with the other? I have a six as like the in-game no, adjusting I, and a little bit stubborn. And yeah, I think, I think Ohio state fans who listen to this would take issue, it's nitpicky. would take issue mostly with the adaptability part of it because everybody in their right mind who follows this would agree that there's plenty of opportunity at Ohio state. Like it's still all there for him. And yeah. if they can assemble the troops and get organized in a big way this season. I mean, this, this could be the year they're going to, they're, we're pretty much already writing them into the playoffs. So I think a nine is like a starting point for opportunity. Um, you know, build quality, the talents there, the coaches are there and he's obviously developing guys, love him or hate him. He's developing yeah, guys and putting them in the league. They're, the recruiting system seems to have reached critical mass where it kind of recruits Bringing itself. in Jim Knowles and Chip Kelly to run either side of yeah, the ball. I mean, come on. And dependability again, Michigan fans would say, yeah, we love Ryan Day's dependability. He loses to us every year. Yeah, of course. Fair point, but he beats everybody yeah. else. So that in and of itself, I, I think we'll, we'll maybe dock him a point because he's not beating Michigan. But otherwise, he's like right there. It's the adaptability piece of this. So what, that, what number would you give him? I gave him a six. I think I agree with you on that one. Okay. I think I agree with you on that one. Um, and it's a six, but it has potential to go up to like an eight very quickly, depending on how they look this season. I, I suppose. Yeah. I'll, 33. I'll, I'll give him the benefit of that. Who, who else is tied with Ryan Day in your, on your list? I have Lance Leipold at a 33 as well. Ow! Oh. I have Lance Leipold. Who else? Who else with, with Lance? And Kalen DeBoer. I have okay. Lance Leipold with 9888. That map, nine, I believe, checks out. 888. Okay. So the interesting thing with Lance Leipold is I think it's only fair. You're not just looking at what he's done in improving Kansas, right? You look at what he did at Buffalo, and then you look at what he did on every other level that he's coached at, winning a ton of national champ, you know, national championship, winning a ton of games. So I have Lance Leipold 9888. So the dependability of like, you can depend on Lance Leipold growing a program without a doubt. Can right? you? A what nine? do you mean, can you? A nine. Did it at Buffalo, a very difficult place to win. Did it at Wisconsin Whitewater. Yeah. Did it at Buffalo, and now mm -hmm. is in the process of doing it at Kansas. Okay. Yes. You could argue, though, devil's advocate. I love Lance Leipold. You know this. Sure. Devil's advocate. He has done that at places that couldn't really go down any further. Right. Okay, I'm not going to speak for Wisconsin Whitewater. I certainly don't know that side of his career as right, well. Right, no, that, it's been a machine there. But yeah, but like I'm just saying his VORP is off the charts. His VORP is off the charts. But in terms of dependability in the early part of his Power 5 career, yeah, it is definitely taking flight. I'm not going a 9, though. If Lance Leipold would have taken over at Michigan, if Lance Leipold eventually takes over at, I'll throw a rock and say Florida, Sure. I mean, we know Jed Fish is going to go to Florida in a year, but let's just throw Lance Leipold in that discussion for now. What what does Lance Leipold look like at a bigger place with better competition than what? But Kansas you're just existing played? in a universe that doesn't exist. I'm choosing to be a reality based evaluator here. He right? has been consistent. I think his results have been reliably pointed up and to the right. Yeah, beats big teams, takes pe players that other people recruited. Brought in transfers that contributed right away. I am not giving him a nine, though, with dependability. It's too soon for me to give him a nine. Two, he's been a head coach forever. Too soon for me to, at, at the Power Five level, how long has he been at Kansas? But he's been a head, we're talking about, we're evaluating him as a head coach. Not, I need, the, not I only need, the Kansas head coach. I need more Power Five data before I'm willing to go nine on Lance Leipold, who I love like a father, okay? That's I weird. love the guy. Hopefully I'd love for him to well. coach yeah. any of my teams. Yeah. But if we are putting true scientific, um, um, what's the word? Methodology, Dan, behind sure. this, I don't go nine. Maybe I go an eight.
but so nice you're, too this high. is how you describe it. How consistent is a coach? Consistently improving a team, without a doubt, right? How reliable are his results? He beats big teams and keeps winning games, right? Yes? How comfortable are we in projecting these results forward? Now, you can say maybe he has a ceiling of improving a team, but not taking them to, you know, a top tier. Well, that's where opportunity threat. would come in. Okay. Right. That's now, you're where opportunity. Giving, you're giving him an eight for opportunity. At Kansas? Yes. At Kansas? Yes. Is that because of the Big 12 changing? It's both because of the Big 12 changing, and it's also because of the teams he has already shown Kansas having an ability to beat or compete with. Right? He's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe or beaten Texas, Oklahoma, schools like that. Um, I just... Man, no, he's, you are, he's beaten both, right? You are he's, out of your mind going this high on Lance Leipold on this Well, scale. basically what I'm saying is I think Lance Leipold has the ability to be Kyle Whittingham, right? Which is not a crazy thing to say. If Kyle Whittingham has an eight ceiling because he's proven it. Wow. And I don't know, man. Okay. Look, he's, we're, he's won a bunch of games. Look, may, it, it, it's optimistic for sure. But the other elements of this, I feel like balance it out. Well, to be fair, I mean, ESPN ranked Lance Leipold ahead of Ryan Day. Sure. And they've got Ryan Day at nine. They've got Lance Leipold, or Ryan Day at 10, Lance Leipold at nine. Yeah. They're pretty high on Lance Leipold. They've got him, again, in between Ryan Day and Lane Kiffin towards the bottom of their top 10. Obviously a very, very good coach. I, I can't go 9-8-8-8 for Lance Leipold. I don't know, man. You look at the depths of Kansas. I'll you go look at Charlie Weiss, Les Miles, David Beatty. Like they've tried a bunch of different ways, and the only one that works since Mark Mangino, Lance Leipold. I will go eight for dependability. Turner Gill. I will, God. I will go eight in terms of adaptability. Build quality? You're giving him an eight? Yes. I'm not giving him an eight. What has he done that is that? You feel like he's done an average job building this roster out. He hasn't played defense. He has multiple quarterbacks. They haven't played defense in two years. That's fair. That's fair. If you want to give him a seven there, it still puts him in the top five-ish category. I will go eight, eight, seven, and for opportunity at Kansas, I'll go seven. Eight, eight, seven, seven. So 16 and 14. So you have him at a 30. I got him at a 30. Okay. That's fair. I, I don't have. Are you okay with that? that? Or are you okay with that? I'm okay with your opinion of it. I'm not going to, you know, take specific. All right. Exception You've got him 33. In, in terms of media, I've never heard Lance Leipold speak. He's pretty good. He's all business, it seems. We'll give him a one. We'll just throw a one in there. So I have Kalen DeBoer in here, and Kalen DeBoer I have as a 9969. Okay. Talk me through. So nine is dependability. Yeah. Nine, I look, we um I, I'm talking myself into a bit of a corner here because of what I just said about, about Lance Leipold. But um similar background, smaller school, overwhelming success. But also, if you're talking about Kalen DeBoer's track record, you're including, I guess, coordinator time and certainly Fresno State time. Yeah. Yeah. So say that again. It was nine 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 six nine for Kalen DeBoer. Nine dependability. How consistent is he? Yeah. Wins, beats yep. really good teams. How reliable is results? Does it in almost identical fashion every time? Um, how, how comfortable are we projecting these results forward? I think he's going to win at Alabama. I, I think you, when you look at, he's just, all he does is exclusively win. Um, and a coach's track record is exclusively winning in, to a huge degree. Adaptability, I'd be inclined to go up to a 10 after this year. After this year. I agree with the nine. Because sure. I think just the, the multitude of guys that he has had under him that he has made better yeah, in a short period of time indicates somebody who knows how to adapt. Sure. All right. So I'm, I'm with that. If he can turn Jalen Milrow into a quarterback that thrives in his system, which is something you know I am skeptical of, even though I like Jalen Milrow, generally speaking, yeah. I, I need to see how he fits into this offense. Because that, that to me remains a big unknown. That's like a big spring and summer and fall question that I think we need to figure out. So I'll go nine because I agree. But if he gets Mill Road to the point where he's thriving in that offense, it's, a, it's an easy 10. Well, certainly. So the adaptability thing wasn't there with the defense. Um, and it's you, you got to 
just weigh the fact that he didn't recruit the roster he didn't by and large the that he had at Washington. Um, and so that's the knock there. But obviously in game, Kalen DeBoer and, you know, winning close games, you know, game planning successfully, like even when they're not playing well, they're not losing because of coaches on the sideline, generally speaking. Hey, look at, and, and you know this better than anybody. Yeah. Look at what he did against Oregon. Yeah. Look at what he did against Oregon twice. I'm not saying this to try and dunk on you or Oregon. Sure. But like. No, I, you're right. I remember he finishes. Those, I remember those conversations we had. I remember the texts you were getting from Jeff, uh, Jeff Schwartz, talking about, you know, Oregon's got an advantage here. Oregon should be able to press that advantage. Yeah. And Washington played defense in a way that we did not expect against a really good Oregon offense. They Especially early. They were ready. Yeah. They were ready. And they were well prepared for that moment. Build quality, though, you got a six. I have a six here because it's not really proven. Look, you have to give him a ton of credit for Michael Penix. That he had the relationship with Michael Tent Penix brings him in. Um, obviously, the offensive coaching staff bringing in the new receivers coach, I believe, from Purdue. Ryan Grubb in huge demand is now, what, the Seahawks, Seahawks. offensive coordinator? Yeah. Um, so... In terms of, you know, the offensive line continue to develop and get better at Washington under him. So a number of different position groups did really well under his assistance. Offense obviously thrived. Um, bringing in Michael Penix was huge, but didn't <laughs> recruit yeah. on a level that is comparable I, to some of the best coaches on this list. I was thinking about it as you gave me those numbers, trying to figure out why you would go so low on the build quality. Yeah. And then I remembered, oh, yeah, he didn't really recruit. The guys he had, no. he developed. And that's got to right. stand for something. But in terms of recruiting, I think he's got a lot to prove. Um, certainly, he had a lot to prove at Washington. And I think mm -hmm. he's going to have even more to prove at Alabama. It's certainly going to be easier to recruit at Alabama. Uh, I think Jalen Polk was another key. I think it was a Texas Tech transfer, but I don't remember if it was under DeBoer or uh, I think it was early DeBoer. Um, but... Yeah, by and large, Dylan Johnson was a Mississippi State transfer, so filled in some gaps really impressively. Jabbar Muhammad from Oklahoma State, so utilized yeah. the portal well in terms of finding, you know, some time or a lot of the time star power. But uh, yeah, high school recruiting still matters to me. We should do one of two things here. Okay, I, okay. Don't, I don't really take issue with this at all. I mean, he deserves to be in the top five, right? Yeah. We either need to bump up build quality to a seven or opportunity to a ten. Build quality to a seven, opportunity to a 10. One of those two. Why? Just went to a national championship perfect. game. Yeah. Went to a national championship game. Um, did well at Fresno, also with Jake Hayner. Yeah. Did very well at Fresno. And I think day one, stepping in at Alabama is going to have an opportunity to get back to that national championship. Um, okay. So you're talking about opportunity, though? His or, ceiling is about as high as any coach in college football. No, I mean, I'm uh, a 10 opportunity indicates to me that you can go toe to toe often with Kirby Smart. Okay. Well, then let's and I go don't build, have somebody on this list that can. Then let's go up build quality. Let's take that to a up, seven. Let's because take that of Penix, up one Muhammad, and okay. Because look, it, it, it definitely stands to reason that. He didn't recruit at Washington the way that we would like to put him a little bit higher on this list. So we're gonna yeah. we're gonna dock him for that. But and developing those receivers was huge. Yeah. His his ability to develop those guys, though, even yeah. if he didn't recruit them, definitely stands for something. And is not the position coach. Yeah. Right. So we'll go, we'll go seven there. What is that? Nine, okay. nine, at 34. Sure. 34. I think he's crazy likable. So that puts too. him even with Whittingham. Even with Whittingham, I think he's crazy likable. And I'll okay. give we'll give him a three. Let's give him three on the on the on the X side of things. crazy likable. I don't know. He seems kind of understated, but he's very understated. I think that makes him likable. OK, right. I'm going to give him a three on that front. So we've got right now Kirby Smart with a 38. Yeah, we've got Whittingham with a 34 alongside Kalen DeBoer, mm -hmm. Ryan Day and Lance Leipold. I'll, I'm not as high on Lance Leipold. I've only got him with a 30. You've got him as okay. a 33 alongside Ryan. Correct. Day. Yeah, we've done five coaches here. Um, let's go through a, a, a few other. I have ones a four-way tie. A four-way tie. Okay, good. six through nine. What is your? Do you want another four, four coaches? Tie? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in no particular order: Chris Kleiman, Dabo Swinney, Dan Lanning, Mike Norvell. Ooh. 
Why don't we do Dabo? Because this is the X Dabo scale, right? Yeah, this one was very difficult for me. I changed this one a bunch. I have Dabo as an 87710. 87710. Yeah. The 10 and makes I, sense. The 10 I can, makes a I lot of sense. I can go 8779. If I'm saying he can go toe to toe with Kirby Smart, which I don't believe to be the case in the present, but when you win multiple national championships and you have proven that you can go toe to toe with the modern, I mean the modern, the all time goat here in Nick Saban, we know Dabo's ceiling is multiple national championships. It's got to be a fact. ten. It's got to be a ten. So I have it as a ten, and it I'm has to be a ten. Stay on it. It has to so, be a ten. So what did I say? Eight nine nine seven, eight seven seven ten. Excuse me. Yeah, we've got eight. Seven, seven, ten. By the way, in the doc, I'm jotting these down as you mentioned them. If it if it helps to kind of keep us aligned here, yeah. Um, lowest grades then are for the adaptability, adaptability and build, yeah. and and build quality. Yeah. Which do you think he is worst at between those two? Adaptability, program philosophy with the portal, I think is where you're going to get knocked down with Dabo because still like adjusting on the fly with decisions, play calling like for the overwhelming majority of his tenure at Clemson, you know, having Brent Venables there, having, you know, Jeff Scott and Tony Elliott do the job they mostly did, especially when they were co-coordinators. Like he oversaw really good philosophy. He oversaw, um, Teams just destroying everybody in their path. Um, and philosophically, his vision was nearly flawless for a long stretch. Now, though, yeah. via the portal, via some of those assistant hires, you're seeing a stubbornness that I knock them down. I would go down farther, man. Further. I know, Excuse but you, you still have to weigh the totality of his career. You can say this is what Dabo is in this. If you were to say, like, I am judging this by exactly what I feel about them in this second as a coach with zero track record. Sure. I go down to a, at least a six on adaptability. Okay. I go down to, I think I got to go down to a six. I agree with the eight. I think eight is actually very, very smart for dependability. I think, by the way, I think that's the right number for the, for the D side of this, but the, Adaptability and build quality, I think, kind of work hand in hand. You know, like he has proven he used to be a little bit more adaptable, but even now he's bringing it. Remember, it was like a big deal. Like, wow, Dabo's got ice in his veins. He won. He stole Garrett Riley. Sure. The same offense. It's the same offense that they ran the year before. And I think um, you, could, you could thing, argue. Yeah. I dock the portal thing a lot. I'm, I'm a five with adaptability for Dabo. Here, here's the here's the knot I worked myself into with Dabo. You can say philosophically, Dabo is taking things off the table, but now with one hand tied behind their back, they still win nine and ten games. So he's adapting to his own poor adaptation pretty well. Right. They've won since Clemson has you know quote unquote fallen off a cliff or whatever. Ten and three, eleven and three, nine and four. He is, he is like the best example we have in the coaching ranks of machine learning. Right? right. It's the cause and solution to all of Clemson's problems. So, yeah, they went 8-0 and in the ACC in 2022. All right. I'll give him a Bowl. 6. I'll give him a 6 in adaptability. Here was, again, in the last three years, here were their, their year-ending AP ranks. 14, 13, and 20 for somebody who fell off a cliff. Still not terrible. He's adapting to his poor adaptation well. Um, build quality. Yeah, I mean, the high school recruiting is still strong. The defense is still very, is great at developing players. Mm. Running back has been good. Receiver has fallen off a cliff, for sure, which is uh, specifically against Dabo, given his position coaching background and the track record at receiver previously. You've got 8, 7, 7, 10. I'll go 8, 6. <sighs> Do I want developing six NFL players. I'll go eight, six, seven, ten. So I'm a point underneath you. What is that? What does that add up to? Eight, eight, seven, four, six, ten. Thirty-two. Eight and seven is fifteen. Six is twenty-one. Thirty-one. I'm a thirty-one. You're a thirty-two. Yeah. Uh, what? What kind of media score does he get? 
In terms of extroversion, the locals love them. I mean, if you're a media, if, if you're a media guy in Clemson, yeah, you 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 love Dabo Sweeney. If you're a Clemson fan, I think you probably, um, on most things anyway, enjoy hearing what Dabo has to say. Um, we enjoy it from a content creation standpoint, just because when you get him off script a little bit, that's when it gets real weird. Um, but he, you know, I think like he the is the personality like of really Clem- like Dabo. He is the personality of Clemson football. I think you're probably giving him a four. I think right? I'm inclined to go four. You don't have to love him, but in He's terms got great of great mic the, skills, yeah, in terms of like his presence behind a microphone, in terms of you understanding who he is as a public person, I think he communicates that very well. Like it or not, I think he does a very good job as a face of a a la- largely winning program. Likeable, unlikable, you, you, you know where he stands. You know where he stands. I agree with that. All right, which were the other three coaches that you had tied with Dabo? So tied with Dabo, I have Chris Kleiman, Dan Lanning, Mike Norvell. <sighs> okay, so Kleiman is not part of ESPN's top 10 ranking. Right. But both Norvell and Lanning are. Norvell I- and Lanning are... Five and six, we have now accounted for ESPN's top six Mm -hmm. in addition to Lance Leipold and Ryan Day. We can get to Sark and Lane Kiffin here momentarily, I'm sure. But um, talk me through the reasoning on Chris Kleiman. I have eights across the board for Chris Kleiman. Okay. I think he's dependable and has a track record to back it up. I think he adapts well. Both sides of the ball have succeeded. Right. Um, they're another one of those teams that, by and large, they're beating the flawed. They are not the flawed in-game. Um, build quality, I think he's done a nice job utilizing the portal. Uh, he's done a nice job on the trail. Nice job developing. I think his hires have been sound. Um, I mean, we'll see how, you know, how well, I think it's the offensive line coach replacing Colin Klein at offensive coordinator. But they've developed... NFL players on both sides of the ball. They've won without NFL players, you know, especially, you know, quarterback, whatever, but Will Howard a couple of years ago. Now, I knocked him down from like a nine, maybe, because of the Adrian Martinez experiment. Yeah. I think that was poor vision there. Uh, coach's ceiling, eight as like can threaten, especially in the current Big 12, can threaten for the conference more often than not. Yeah. Conference championship caliber won the conference with Texas and Oklahoma in it two years ago. I'm a I'm a a solid thirty on climbing. So your eights across the board of thirty two. Yeah, I agree with the first two eights. I go seven in terms of build quality because it's a talent question. It's it's not a development question. Sure, it is a talent question. Yeah, and receiver fell off last year a bit. I want to see what Avery Johnson looks like. I want to see what Avery Johnson looks like if given more of a role in this offense. I know you're high on him. I'm high on him too. I, they are as well. But I want to see what he can do if he can turn that, uh, you know, he's a pretty highly rated recruit. If he can turn him into something at quarterback that they have not had, that would be, I think, a very positive signal. On the opportunity side, it's interesting, you know, it, there's a little bit of addition by subtraction, isn't there? Because sure. you've got Texas and Oklahoma leaving, leaving the Big 12. You've got, I think, a power vacuum of sorts at the top now because those schools are gone. You've also got an expanded playoff. And there's probably going to be two teams from the Big 12 getting into this thing, which is opportunity for Kansas State in a way that they have not had, again, given that vacuum. So I'm, I think before, if I were a six, I'm going to go seven now on the opportunity side just because of the addition by subtraction thing. So I'm, we agree, we, we disagree. Agree on most, disagree on the final number. I've ultimately got climbing in line with Lance Leipold, which is not something I planned, but kind of works out in the great right. state of Kansas. Um, what do we think for media chops? A- a- any kind of bonus points here for the... Yeah, two or three. That's fine. We got Lance Leipold as a one. Yeah. Yeah, somewhere there. One or two. I'll give him That's a one. That's fine. All right. So climbing, we, you know, By the way, disagree on some minor things. Just in terms of build quality as well. 
the 24-7 sports metric had the number 1,200 player in the class of 2020 as somebody Kansas State looked at and said, come on in. Do spot. Wow. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Um, Lanning. Okay. Lanning's grades as I have them are da, 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 8798. 8798. And let me yeah. start the conversation with on, on Lanning with this. Mm-hmm. He gets the full five in extroversion. Okay. He gets the full five. I think he has played the media about as well as anybody in college football. Okay. Better than Lane Kiffin. He's out there. He puts himself out there. Agree. He puts himself out there. And I, I will hearken back to something that we talked a little bit about amid the coaching carousel. Dan Lanning used the rumors about him potentially being interested in, you know, Alabama. Mm-hmm. Better than anybody. Mike Norvell used it to get a pay increase and maybe was interested in that job. But Dan Lanning reportedly was never all that interested in it. Likes right. where he's at. Wasn't so much interested in getting the pay increase or anything like that. He was interested in the social media hit that he could get from it. They had a video ready to roll. I am not the Oregon alum between But is the two this of us. his personality or is this his like strategic? It mind? doesn't matter. It doesn't okay. matter if it's personality or strategery. Yeah. But the fact that they had a video ready to roll almost the millisecond that he turned that job down, sure. that tells me this is a dude who's scheming. Like there's some Game of Thrones stuff going on up in his head that yeah. he gets the five. He gets the five for how he used the media. The only other person that I'm going to give a five to on the media side is Brian Kelly. Because Brian Kelly is a politician first and foremost. A lot of folks don't like him for that. Oh, I, have because, Mac, I have Mac Brown as a five, but continue. Uh, okay, we could go. I could. You, I could be talking. He's to the that. politician's politician. Yeah. Eight seven nine eight with the with the kicker of the five for landing is what you've got. Talk me through that quickly. Uh, I have landing as a three, by the way, in terms of personality. Really, he's he gives very generic answers. I don't think he's shown much of a sense of humor, which is fine. Can we? But split I'm saying the difference if you're going to go four, I'll 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 split the difference and go four with you. Okay. Um, all right. Eight as in terms of dependability, one double digit games, uh, ended his season, uh, in the conference championship game and blowing out a clearly inferior team in a new year's six game. Um, I am very comfortable given where the talent is and will continue to be saying he is going to be dependably at an eight or nine, but right now, um, you know, I, I, I just have him as an eight cause he just hasn't broken through in terms of like showing that what he can do against Utah or whoever is meaningful when they play Washington, right? Um, adaptability on the fly with decisions. What did I say? Six? No. You've got a seven. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I obviously have Oregon bias here, but like, yes, there are moments where you can argue, yes, too aggressive. But there is a very specific vision to it. He's not inconsistent with that. And so philosophically he's saying we are always going to have our foot on the gas. And yes, that might get him in trouble. Yes, you can question some of the individual ones, absolutely. But he's sticking to an ethos and I I think that's smart. So that's why I docked points because, you know, some of the overaggression, but play calling wise, I think they're in a, a great place. He's hired two good offensive coordinators. That have okay. adapted to the modern game really well. I, I take issue with some of this, but why don't you why don't you close it out? Uh, build quality. I I'm near a ten, but it's a nine. Um, and I don't really have like if it's a ten, it's he's stringing together top three classes essentially, and he hasn't done that yet. They've right. been incredible right. in the portal. They've added a ton of value in the portal. Well, obviously, Bo Nix is the height of that. Uh, but you know, bringing in Dylan Gabriel now, Dante Moore, the pieces on defense, especially at corner this coming year, Evan Stewart at receiver, Tez Johnson last year, it said, you know, went over a thousand yards. Um, Bucky Irving, like they're all just enormous wins. So I've had a nine just because they haven't strung together enormous classes yet. Um, and then what did I have as the final one? You had an uh, eight. Lanning had an eight in terms of ceiling. 
Mostly because haven't seen him win a conference, haven't seen him in this current conference. So Okay. Okay. I can see a universe in which, especially in a 12 team playoff world, he's a nine after next year. I agree. I agree with that. Here here's the issue but I have. But you have, have with this, to though. take in the data we have as well. The issue I have with this is on the dependability side. Okay. And it's just a numbers game. He's been coach at Oregon for what, two years? Yep. We've got two years worth of data. Yeah. Um, three recruiting classes. Three recruiting classes. Want, finished 10 and three overall after the first season with the bowl win. 12 and two this past year destroyed Liberty in the Fiesta Bowl. Yeah. Those are two really good results, year one and two. I'm not ready to go that high on the dependability scale. You know, like because why? Going into a new conference that I think is um, more difficult. I think only two years to fall back on. At the on. top. At the top. Yeah. Only two years to fall back on with that number. Um, with a USC that was problematic. Mm -hmm. With a Utah team that didn't have a quarterback. Sure. With a Washington team that was very good that they lost to twice this past Three season. Times. Three, Three times, times Ty, Three need times. I remind Three. you. Yeah. Three times, excuse me. Um, I'm a six on dependability, Dan. Six? I'm a six. With the potential to go up very quickly. You know, if he, if he wins 11 games this year, let's go up to uh, seven and eight. So but the track, we're, okay. We're grading him with, with respect to track record. We are grading him against guys who have been in their positions for much longer and have much more of a proven track record. By comparison, Dabo Sweeney is also an eight. Are we going to give Chris Kleiman is also an eight? By your metric, yeah. Lance Leipold's a nine. Are we going to give Dan Lanning an eight when compared to uh, Ryan Day, who's a nine, winning 10 games yes. a year? Are we going to put Le Dan Lanning that high in the dependability he's, metric? He's consistently won. He's consistently improved both twice. sides he's of the ball. Twice. He's done it twice. Not consistently. He's done it twice. I'm saying consistently won over like 25 games or something like that. Um, how comfortable are we in projecting what he's done forward? I'm very comfortable. Are you comfortable? No, that's why oh, I give him okay. a six. So you're not comfortable. Okay. Agree to disagree. That's the only thing I disagree with. I love Dan Lanning. Yeah. I've got him a six, seven, nine, eight. So I'm at six, a six, seven, nine, eight. So a 30, 30 for me, 32 for you. We split the difference. We'll go four. And the X right. kicker. And then I think it's Norvell. You got Mike Norvell. Okay. Yes. Give me his numbers. Uh, Mike Norvell, I have at uh, bah, bah, bah. seven, eight, eight, nine, seven dependability, yeah. eight adaptability, eight mm -hmm. in terms of build quality, nine. No, nine, nine build quality, nine build and quality, nine opportunity, and yeah. nine opportunity. Okay. Thank you, computer. Appreciate that. Talk me through it quick. Dependability. Why seven? Uh, the consistency. The consistency through his time. Now, you, you add in success at Memphis, of course. Um, but at Florida State, I don't know. There's, it, it's been a little bit inconsistent. Not blowing out teams like you blow out LSU in the second half, and then you sneak by a couple of ACC teams, or you just don't look as up for some of those games uh, within the ACC. It seems um, projecting a, the results forward, I I don't know. They're they're overhauling a lot. Um, yeah, I just don't think they've been a super consistent performer, even when winning games. Right. I think his track record is there, but I think I'm just a little impressed, less impressed with the pop that Florida State has had. Here, here's where here's where the dependability and build quality, I think, play off each other really well. Okay. All right. So, the build quality side of this from Mike Norvell in his time at Florida State has been an interesting balance that he has walked. And I've yeah. used Norvell often as an example of somebody who knew how to use the portal well in addition to Definitely. the recruiting. He has walked that balance, used the portal effectively, used recruiting effectively, kind of used them together as one thing as opposed to high school recruiting, transfer portal being separated. Yeah. He has played one off the other 
in, I think, a particularly interesting way, bringing in guys like Jared Verse, bringing guys like Keon Coleman in, right? He has had an eye for the talent that is out there and he's used that to make the team better. We'll see this year with DJU. You know, yeah. we could do our own ex Dabo on DJU if we wanted to, and we could talk through that. So the dependability side of this is is an interesting concept. I mean, he's had a he's had a five and seven season that featured a loss to Jacksonville State. And like there has to be some knocks on him. There has to be a knock and and yeah. The the Jordan Travis thing kind of masks the dependability side of this. Yeah. He made Jordan Travis better. Jordan Travis got better. Of course. But what do you have behind Jordan Travis? Not much. That was kind of the argument against Florida State, right? Jordan Travis. Sure, but I think it's just more and more difficult now in 2023, 2024, no, right in the portal era to have like a deep quarterback room. Like it's just, you know, it's never going to be USC with like Carson Palmer and Matt Leinart in the same room and John David Boot. Like it's just not. It's to not going like to be a that. Bunch no, of no. capable guys. Yeah. It's not. It's not. It's not going to be that. To have like Garrett Nussmeyer as your backup. Yeah. It's. It's not going to be that. I. I agree. Um. But I. I do wonder if we knock him a little bit because there wasn't a plan B behind Jordan Travis. Um. Sure. If we knock him a little bit because there is the the five and seven season, we've gotten better, right? Yeah. Probably also, Tate Rodemaker hurt. did get hurt. He was like a capable guy and got hurt. Got hurt. Okay. All right. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. You've got here again for Norvell, just to reiterate, a seven, seven eight, eight, nine. Seven in terms of dependability and mm -hmm. eight in terms of adaptability. I think he's been pretty good. Yeah. I think that's been on clear that improvement on both sides of the ball. Yeah. An eight or excuse me, a nine in terms of build quality. Yeah, I mean, the portal stuff has been great. The portal stuff's been great. I'm Keon going down Coleman, to- Johnny Wilson, yeah. I'm going to go down to an eight, though. Trey Benson. Seven, eight, eight, and I'll go nine as well. I don't know, man. You're bringing in full-on star power in the portal. I don't, you know, I'm not crazy high on DJU, but year over year to keep doing that. Mm. So now, hasn't been stringing together Jimbo-like classes. Right. Had a couple right. of pretty major whiffs and like has late developed flips. the talent well. Okay, we'll go. We'll go. I I agree with you. You talk me into it. Seven eight eight nine. Seven eight eight nine. So that's what fifteen eighteen thirty three for Norvell. Now I I may have been a little bit ambitious with the nine opportunity, but that also just sort of comes in what the ACC for as long as Florida State is in it, like clear path to the playoff consistently has already shown the ability to build a playoff caliber program, has won double-digit games these last two years. So I don't think it's crazy to say, like, if a nine opportunity means consistent playoff conversation, I think Florida State fits that. Pending long-term quarterback proof, I suppose. I'll throw in an extra point. But because of his On background, I, you know, I give him the benefit of the doubt with quarterback as well. 33 and then one point if we want to go kicker. That was your four-way tie. Um, you that was round my four-way tie. You want to round so, out your top 10 quick? Well, I have another set of ties there. Okay. Because I didn't use decimals. Um, oh, but here's... So I have another four, five-way tie. All right. Well, 10 let's, through 14. I'll well, go through it quickly. We don't need to go through each element. Why, why don't we do this? Yeah. My hunch is that there will be a fair amount of discussion yeah. around this ranking system. We know yeah. our audience well. People are going to, I think, True. be into the X dabo Mm -hmm. And we can certainly make another show out of this at some point soon. Yeah. Let's round out what you've got now here with your five-way tie, you said? Five-way tie. 31. Five-way tie. 31s. Um, All right. You just tell me if you would separate it or leave it as is. Okay? Okay. Go ahead. James Franklin, Lane Kiffin, Mike Gundy, Steve Sarkeesian, Luke Fickle. I have in their own 31-point tier. James Franklin, Steve Sarkeesian. Lane Kiffin, Mike Gundy, Luke Fickle. Hmm. Sark for recent pop, but you have to take full track record. Gundy for totality of his career. Kiffin for recent pop. Um, uh, Franklin for consistency, but with a definitive ceiling. Luke Fickle with what he did at Cincinnati is crazy impressive, and I'm still optimistic that he can hit a bunch of benchmarks at Wisconsin. And you said Gundy, too. Gundy as well, just because he's been largely very consistent, has developed players on both sides of the ball well, has 
largely a really good eye for assistant coaches. So that's what powered his score there. You want to see the next three-way tie, or do you want to hit anything specific? Well, I don't... That, like, do any of those guys not fit in that region? I'm surprised Brian Kelly isn't higher for you. Now, I'll tell you why Brian Kelly that's is not the... as, as high for me. Can that, I tell you why? That's the one. Go ahead. I'll... I completely forgot to grade Brian Kelly for okay. this exercise. Well, that's okay. Look, let's, let's okay. be honest. This is I a totally show about forgot honesty. about Brian Kelly. This is a okay. show about honesty. Do you so, want me to quickly grade out Brian Kelly? No, I want you to go through your 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 tie breaking thoughts here on those five guys that you had tied. Give give me your numbers for all five of those guys, just real quick. Uh, we have to talk through each of them in detail, and then okay. we can we can maybe figure out where we want to put Brian Kelly. All right, Kiffin, I have as seven eight eight eight. Okay. Sark, I have as 7798. Gundy, I have at 8788. Fickle, I have at 8788 as well. And who's the last one? The last one here would be James Franklin. Franklin, I have as 8698. Man, I don't agree with these. I really what, tell don't. me about the Franklin one that you don't agree with. I absolutely know what I'm getting from James Franklin, dependably. You know I know that he them. is going to struggle to adapt and philosophically struggle at times. That's a six. Build quality, both portal and high school, I have as a nine. I would go lower. I would and, go lower. I mean, he's been, he's been so good as a recruiter where I think there is some real question is... Oh, man, I don't know. He's developed like high round picks at like every position group. Not quarterback. Does quarterback matter still? Okay. Quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. matters a lot. But quarterback, quarterback has a lot. developed. Like Trace McSorley, like I think there have at least been you're right. You're right. So you want to say eight? Fine. I I'll say you know you definitely know what you're getting with him from a dependability side of yeah. things. And I would actually go a seven instead of an eight. Because I think this is one of those instances where dependability and adaptability are hand in hand. Okay. He is dependably bad at in-game decisions. Okay. Okay. So I dock him on on both of those fronts. I would say seven five eight eight for Franklin. Man, I still think the build quality. Like you're totally right about quarterback, um, and that's where I docked Kirby Smart. So it would be you know a bit of a uh, a, a both direction element for me here. But like. I don't know, with like the defenses that have come through recently, offensive line, and just in terms of development, you know, Ola Fashanu is going to be a you know, top whatever draft pick this Very year. Very good. Look, has put Tight guys end in the has league. been money. Receiver, has, there's been star power until this past year. Until if you look this past at, year. Until this past year. Until this past year. But there has been star quality there with what, Jahad Dotson, Jahan Dotson and KJ Hamler most recently. You've like Hamler, you've got Chris Godwin. I mean, there have been plenty of Deshaun guys. Deshaun Hamilton. That, yeah, like there have been real, like across the field, Corner, safety, linebacker. Like, they may have had the best linebacker of the past decade at Penn State. We have an eight. Parsons. We have an eight, right? Did you give him an eight or a nine there? Oh, I had him at as a nine. You want to give him an eight? Just because of across the board on both sides of the ball. Give me your numbers again for Franklin. Running back has been struggle. Give, give me your number one more high time. High level star power. Uh, for Franklin? Yeah, you had an eight, eight six, six, nine, eight. Nine, eight. Yeah. I'm a seven, five, nine, eight. Seven, five, nine, eight. So you have a 29? I have it. Uh, no, no, no. What is that? 17. Plus, yeah, 29. Um, and you're a little bit higher than you've got a 14. I'll go through the rest of my stuff. I think it's fair to give Brian Kelly a score here. He's at LSU. He's done incredible things as a college football coach. Do, do this firstly, okay? Yeah. Just give me, give, give me a real quick rundown of the Lane Kiffin versus Steve Sarkeesian debate. You've got 7798 for Sark and 7888. Well, Kiffin. so these guys have like the interesting element compared to a lot of these guys of coaching at major places previously. Yeah. And coaching at the same place yeah. for a moment in coaching time. At the same place. Yeah. Right. So that that's why I wanted to spot shadow these two. And well, see also we like within the Alabama program as well, like very close tenures. Yeah. Yeah. So talk and me, overlap talk me when through, Sark took over in the national championship game. Yeah. T- talk me through how you graded these guys out because Sark recently was at a playoff Lane Kiffin has obviously been doing a lot on the on the talent side as well that has made waves right um in the in the portal here so far this off season. You still grade Sark higher, which I think I agree with, but mm-hmm. seven seven nine eight for Sark, seven eight 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 
for Lane Kiffin. If you add it up again, this is the Dan list, not necessarily mine. I'm kind of the devil's advocate here. You've, you've got them graded equally. Yeah, I'm comfortable with saying Texas will dependably have a good defense and great offense by and large moving forward um, after these last couple of years. Uh, adaptability, I think I knocked, I have as a seven there. Um, philosophically, I think they're in a good place. You know, their they're year two years ago gave me some pause about Texas in the second half and uh, even in their game against Washington, to be honest, like just deciding you know, to go against what has worked for them this year. And that was the run setting up the pass. Like they went away from the run. And I know there were fumbles that helped to uh, inform those decisions. But even still, like they were getting whatever they wanted against Washington on the ground and went away from it, especially early on in drives. Um, so I knocked him there as a seven. But like you still like it worked to the tune of winning the conference in a blowout and ending up in the playoff. So um, that's why I give him nine build quality, been great in the portal and high school ranks. Um, and I think his assistant hires have been strong to very strong, especially when you look at Pete Kutkowski and what he did with the defense in a couple of years and what the both lines turned into this past year. Um, I just think it would be hard to give him anything less than a nine. Uh, and then an eight in terms of opportunity, um, just within the SEC moving forward, like I have them in the mix for winning the conference. And I just don't think they're going to be consistently in the playoff conversation, but I can see a universe in which they are. I just, we've seen a year from Sark putting it together. We've seen a year. Yeah, I, I think I agree with all that on Sark. Where I disagree is with Kiffin. Okay. I disagree a little bit with Kiffin. I understand where you're coming from, dependability with the seven. Seven, eight, eight, eight. Yeah. I understand where you're coming from, adaptability in eight. Okay. Has been pretty good in game. Has been pretty good at modifying the philosophy of the program as needed. Has been good using the portal, right? Yeah. Um, but again, adaptability, build quality do kind of work hand in hand a little bit. Mm -hmm. I dock him a little bit on the build quality. I he's recruited well and has been like nails in the portal. He's been really portal good King. at, he's been really good at talent acquisition. Do you yeah. feel like they are making guys better? Do you feel like there are, there, there is like this conveyor belt of guys who are getting better under Kiffin moving on to the NFL and that that has become an NFL factory of sorts. In terms of player development, no, nah, maybe not an NFL factory. Um, but this is college football, and I just college need them football. to get to a point where they're good players winning college games. I'm a seven there. I'm an easily influenced seven, maybe up to an eight. Okay, but I go down. I go down. So that's just where I have them as an eight. Yeah, you've got an eight. I've got. I've got a seven, and I think it's because I feel like they get into these big games. And with the talent that they have, maybe I should knock them with adaptability instead. Actually, that's what I'll do. Let me, okay. let me go seven, seven, eight. They get into these big games and they just get like blown off the field by Georgia. You know, sure. That's not necessarily a scarlet letter. A lot of teams get blown off the field by Georgia. Yeah. I just want to expect more from Lane Kiffin. The, the part where I really disagree is on opportunity. I really disagree with opportunity. Eight, as in conversation for conference crown? I'm going to go down to a six. A six? They went 10 and two last year. Okay. They did go 10 and two. And that, I think, works to dependability. I just think it's really hard to, to realize that ceiling that you're saying with an eight when you've got SEC competition and when we've got the almost track record of not living up to that hype yeah and that that's why i dock him there because i just think i think it has gotten harder it has gotten harder it's gotten a little bit easier because kiffin's walking away yeah but everything else around the sec is wide open and harder and just adding a guy like a walter nolan or whoever through the portal does not necessarily make me forget about what we've seen in the past so i i agree that the opportunity is there i think we're all pretty high on lane kiffin i we like lane kiffin by but, the way, if we're dealing, if Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss existed in a 12-team playoff universe, he's making the playoff two of the past three years. I know. I know. I know. So that kind of fits how I'm, my, I looked at it, and we're looking at it in different ways, but that's how, that's my defense of an eight there, that he's in the playoff conversation two out of three years? I mean, like, in the playoff? I don't know. I'm, I'm mixed on how high this program can fly. Okay. 
I'm at I'm at a 28. We I'll give him though. Give him a solid four for the uh, for the X factor there with the okay. extra version. I think he's been really good at doing that. Um, Do you want me to keep going? We've got Gundy and Fickle, both eight, seven, eight, eight. I'm. I don't know how you can give Gundy an eight with build quality. I just I don't know how you could do that. That that to me is like malpractice. He's a good coach. I might go nine dependability. You know what you're going to get with him pretty much most years. But yeah, I mean, build there's, quality. Twenty twenty two is thrown in there though. Yeah, I've been throwing around build quality with Mike Gundy as like a pejorative for the last three years. So we can have that discussion at some other point in time. And my hunch is again, because there are so many other coaches that I know people are going to have an opinion on. We're almost definitely going to need to do a part two of this. Sure. Brian Kelly though. Brian Kelly. Let's grade him out to finish this out, to finish the show out and see where he fits. Where does Brian Kelly fit here? Let's talk it through as a collective. Um, uh, I would have Brian Kelly as a nine dependability. Eight or nine. It's got to be. Uh, adaptability, play calling, overall program, philosophy, decisions. I'd have him as an eight there. Okay. I'm not wowed year to year with what Notre Dame and LSU have always looked like in games and the, the big step back on defense. Um, build has shown, quality. Has, has definitely shown throughout his career the ability to be adaptable. Yeah. The ability to be adaptable. There is some, I think, question as to whether or not he is proactively adaptable or yeah. if it's just when guys leave. Now, he did fire Matt House. Yeah, fired Brian Van Gorder. Has whiffed on DC a couple, at least a couple times. But I think by and large, pretty adaptable yeah. and has a good, strong philosophy for his programs. So I think eight's about right to me. That, but also that, you're talking about Brian Kelly, who um, has done, like, Tommy Reese is a good offensive coordinator. I don't know if he's great. He's good. You have Tommy Reese. You have the string of defensive coordinators at Notre Dame in what Marcus Freeman, Clark Lee, and Mike, Mike Elko. Elko. Yeah. Like really nice eye for both position coaches by and large, uh, but especially defensive coordinator, which as an offensive guy, nailing defensive coordinator is pretty significant. And it's not not batting a thousand, but is has hit some solid wood. Um build quality. I have it as an eight. I have nine eight eight nine for Brian Kelly. Notre Dame is is competing for a playoff pretty often with him as head coach, and he will absolutely be competing pretty often at LSU for a 12-team playoff. I'm 8-8-8-9. Eight, 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 I'll go one point shy. So what did I say? If I said 9-8-8-9, eight, eight, that's 18 and 16, that's 34. So that puts him at like the 2 or 3. You got him as a 34. I'll go, I'll go 33. Okay. Um, and look, I'm a 5. I'm a five with the X, the X factor, the extra version thing. Um, I don't know if Brian Kelly is the proverbial guy you'd like to have a beer with, like Lane Kiffin. Right. Maybe like Dan Lanning or even James Franklin to some extent. Dabo yeah. probably goes into that conversation as well. I think the knock on Kelly from people who have played under him is that you, just, you don't really know who he is. He sort of plays a character when he's out there as the coach. Uh but he's very good at playing politician. He's very good at doing that. Everywhere he's been, he's been very, very good. He's a decent quote. I, I think I, I knock, I do a little bit of the knock against him with like the turning beat red on the sidelines early on in Notre Dame. Beat red. Um, I might throwing, give him a four here. I'm not just throwing coaches, out five. Yeah. Throwing coaches, throwing players under the bus, not taking yeah. responsibility for things. He's got a track record for that as well. Yeah. I'm, but again, I'm you a, have a sense for his personality though. You he's know not exactly covering who he up. Is. Yeah. You know exactly who he is. So I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a solid five here because I think he's a good politician. We agree, sli disagree slightly on the overall metric, but here is the way that this has kind of shaken out. Yeah. If we are talking through our top. This 10. is our general consensus, although not generally. Exact. Yeah. Generally speaking. And again, there will be a part two. We need to talk about the likes of Deion Sanders and Lincoln Riley. There's a Brent Venables conversation that needs to be had a i Jeff have been on my list yep a crystal ball i want to talk about kirk ferentz and matt rule and mike elko and 
Here's we're, by the way, this is who I graded two. out. I'm not going to give you their grades. Yeah. After Save after it. that tie, that five way tie, I have Marcus Freeman, Mario Cristobal. Again, no order. Uh, Marcus Freeman, Mario Cristobal, Kirk Ferentz, Jonathan Smith, Lincoln Riley, Gus Malzahn, Mark Stoops, Jeff Tedford, Pat Narduzzi, um, Troy Calhoun. Uh, I, I'm I'm trying to like scramble these so I don't give anything away. Yeah. yeah. Um, but this is no particular order. No this particular no order. Particular. Those guys. So I I with Brian Kelly, I've graded out thirty guys. I almost had a coronary when you said Freeman next. There's no way Freeman no, does not Marcus belong. Marcus Freeman's on my list of graded out coaches, but yeah. He, he deserves a grade. He does not deserve to be in the upper echelon. Not yet. Could get there. A lot of potential, obviously, but yeah. Okay. Here is the way that we have ranked these out then. We've got Kirby Smart one. I think, I think that's obvious. The next highest score, he's got 38 points. The next highest scores are Kyle Whittingham with a 34, Kalen DeBoer, with a 34 and we've got Brian Kelly also with a 34. There are some slight disagreements here, but generally that's where we're at. Next rung down after that 34, there is a gap between Kirby Smart and the next closest. We've got Ryan Day with a 33, Mike Norvell with a 33. I've got Brian Kelly with a 33, but obviously he's still in that conversation. Yeah. And then the next rung down, we've got Dabo, with 32, 31 points, we've got Chris Kleiman, 32 points. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Lanning, with 32 points. I should add, Lance Leipold also had a 33. Yeah. We're pretty high on Lance Leipold. Um, and then beyond that, we've got the likes of guys like Steve Sarkeesian. We've got the likes of guys like Lane Kiffin with a 31. Yeah. We've also got James Franklin, who's in there. You had him at a 31. I had him at a, a 29. You yep. had Luke Fickle and Mike Gundy and such. So listen, here is what I promised to do for the Verballer Hood. Okay. On our website, I will put these numbers together into a table so that you can read them more easily. Great. And you could tell us what you think and where we went wrong. That will be on our website at solidverbal.com where you can find all of, our old, all of our old episodes and clips and if you want to read more about Dan and I, okay? If you're into that thing. I will make a table out there where you can read all of these and think about them and put your thoughts into an email or preferably into a social media response out on Twitter, out on Instagram, out on threads, wherever you are, we will post this. Yeah. And you can let us know what you think. There will be a part two coming next week. Do we agree on all that? Agree. Done. The, the X Dabo, Dan. X Dabo. Sorry. Dependability, adaptability, build quality, opportunity. And then the X factor is just how they are behind the mic, dealing yeah. with the media, that sort of thing. Yeah. Extraversion grade. Extraversion. We covered all of ESPN's top 10 in our own specific way. Write in solidverbal at gmail.com. Let us know your thoughts yeah. on the X Dabo metric. Who Please we should grade know. out, how you grade that person out. By the way, alphabetically, it's Calhoun, Ferentz, Freeman, Fritz, Gus, Heipel, Mac, Mario, Narduzzi, 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 Rule, Riley, Smith, Stoops, Tedford, Venables. That's all just alphabetical, not grade wise. Okay. Gus got, got a first name in there. That was nice. We've got many more coaches to yes. cover here. As part of this new thing we are rolling out, let us know your thoughts. Again, appreciate the social media engagement. It helps more people find us. Just That's true. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Hit follow, hit subscribe, wherever it is you are listening or watching to this podcast episode right now. Verballers.com. Get this a little bit early without the ads for the support what Dan and I do. Agree. This is fun, man. I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I, I'm surprised you enjoyed it being wrong as often as you were. Like, I felt like that would have dented your excitement, but I'm glad to see it didn't. For that guy over there, my good friend Dan Rubenstein, for myself, Ty Hildenbrandt, we will be back with more X Dabo. X Dabo. Next beep, week. Beep, In the meantime, beep. stay solid. Peace.